This episode is sponsored by The Alcohol Experiment, a free 30-day challenge designed to interrupt your patterns, give you control, restore your health, and put you back in touch with the version of you who doesn't need alcohol to cope, relax, or enjoy life. More than 220,000 people have already tried The Alcohol Experiment for themselves and have seen improved sleep, increased happiness, reduced anxiety, and so much more. Join thousands in this inspiring, hopeful, and exciting program where you examine your beliefs and reconnect with the best version of you without ever feeling like you're missing out. Start today for free at alcoholexperiment.com. Hi, this is Annie Grace and welcome to this Naked Mind podcast and I'm here with Marilyn. Welcome. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Annie. Oh, I'm so happy to have you. So um, why don't you sort of take us back to the beginning and tell us where this all, your journey with alcohol really began for you? Okay. Well, uh, I grew up in Puerto Rico, and in 1981, my mom got remarried, and we moved to to Baltimore, Maryland. And my mom really didn't really drink very much, so there was no alcohol in the house uh, during my teens. And uh, the first time I can remember really drinking was one of the neighbors hired me as a hostess for this party they were having, and they had a pitcher labeled Manhattan's. And uh, I took a couple of uh, drinks and I finally made it home very drunk. And I was very hungover and very sick the next day. And so of course my mom obviously noticed uh, when I had come home and like this. And so she gave me, you know, the talk about how alcoholism ran in my family and she didn't really want me drinking and all of this kind of stuff. And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But, you know, in high school and I I didn't really hang out with a drinking crowd. So, and like I said, there wasn't really any alcohol in my house. So it wasn't really a part of my life in high school. Then uh, once I went to college, um, that's where I think my drinking really started. And once I was in college, I was pre-med, it was very stressful and all the people around me, you know, were drinking. I started waitressing to make money. And, uh, and now I say, you know, that that, that uh, occupation drinks a lot, but I have learned that all occupations really drink a lot. Uh, so but, as, yeah, but as a waitress, you know, I started smoking, which I didn't used to do, you know, that people would stop for a smoke break and I started going out with them. And then pretty soon I was smoking and then I, we were, you know, after shifts, we were drinking and smoking and all that kind of stuff. So um, I think that that's when my drinking kind of really, you know, ramped up, but everybody else was doing it. All my friends were, were doing the same things. So that sort of continued through my 20s and 30s. Um, of course, I was progressively drinking more and more, but my friends were also you know, drinking with me more and more. And I was also being very productive. Um, I had decided not to go to med school, but I had joined a graduate, graduate program in psychology. So I was doing that graduate program, I was working. Um, so I didn't see any of the downsides from drinking, um, uh, you know, re- except for uh, the hangovers and stuff like that. But uh, my day to day, you know, just involved drinking and that was fine. I finally did stop smoking and I can't believe that <laughs> I was like, oh, I should stop this terrible thing. But I didn't even question my drinking and, you know, uh, none of my friends who we all stopped smoking together really question our drinking. And um, at this time was one of the first times I started using alcohol as an escape mechanism. And I started drinking wine to finish my dissertation. Um, I would work all day and then I would have to go write on my dissertation at night and I really didn't want to do it. And so I would take a bottle of wine with me. um, And while I was writing, I was drinking and it just made it bearable for me. You know, and so um, I think that was the first time that I was like, oh, I need to use this substance rather than just for fun. Um, So uh, I got I got my Ph.D. um, in my early 30s. I got married and I was so happy that neither my husband uh, or I wanted kids because I was like, I don't think I could stop for nine months. 
And so because we don't want kids, I don't have to. And so um, a lot of our friends started having family and, you know, their lifestyle started changing a little bit, um, at least that I could see. Uh, now I know there might have been drinking, you know, at other times. But for me, my lifestyle didn't really change all that much. You know, I didn't have to get up early. If I went drinking, you know, I could stay out late and wake up late. And so, you know, I, again, I wasn't missing work or doing any other stuff. So I was like, oh, this is fun. Um, but towards my late 30s, my husband and I uh, started having trouble. And, um, you know, he would wa go watch TV in the bedroom at night. I would stay outside and watch TV and drink. Mm -hmm. And that's just what I was doing. And then finally in 2009, late 2009, my husband asked me for a divorce. Um, and at this point I had been smoke free probably for about eight years. And Annie, the first thing I, I did is I went to Trader Joe's and I got a carton of cigarettes and mm -hmm. a case of two buck chuck. Mm -hmm. And that is what I did to get through my divorce for the first couple of months. I just smoked and drank. I hardly ate. Um, I would, you know, drink very little, I eat very little, but drink one or two bottles of wine so I could get through the day and so that I could sleep at night. Um, you know, it was just a, a, a big shock, even though in hindsight, I, I knew it, things weren't good and and I should have seen it coming, but of course, you know, when it happens, you don't, um, you know, you're right in the middle of it. So I was drinking a lot um, and I actually was at a bar one day um, during the day when I should have been working. Um, I took a lunch break and I was drinking near my office and uh, my, uh, my husband walked in and <laughs> we started talking and drinking and we just really hit it off. And three months later, um, you know, we were together and we moved in together six months later. So it was really quick, but our whole, you know, we met at a bar. So <laughs> drinking was very much part of our lifestyle. You know, we were the party house um, in San Francisco. We threw great parties. You know, we were always going out. He has uh, older kids, uh, an older son. So again, we didn't uh, really have any parenting things that we had to do. Um, we did think about, you know, uh, maybe having kids. And, um, you know, now I know I ended up having a um, blighted ovum, which is a pregnancy that terminates. Um, and so you just have like the, the placenta and all that, but, the, but there's no viable, um, you know, uh, embryo or anything like that. And now I know that's probably because I was drinking a lot, you know, my body was like, no, you know, I can't handle this. Um, and after that, we were like, you know, no, we're not, we don't really want kids. And so, you know, we moved on and, and that was good. And uh, again, we were drinking with friends, we were drinking with each other, everything was good. Um, I'm a big, big baseball fan. In 2010, the Giants uh, went to the World Series and they were like, a big underdog. And I said to my husband, if uh, the Giants win the World Series, I'm going to quit drinking. Because I just thought it was like, so not going to happen. And of course, when the Giants were winning the final game of the World Series, my husband's opening champagne, and he's like, what did you say about that drinking? And I was like, oh, that's, that was ridiculous. I don't know what I was talking about. Of course, I'm not going to quit drinking. Um, and uh, later that uh, year, we actually moved from San Francisco to Oakland and we moved right next to a bourbon bar. And that bourbon bar was our cheers. You know, we walked in, everybody knew us, we, you know, all our friends were from, they worked there or they, uh, you know, um, went there. And so uh, now our drinking really, really ramped up. And I was having to drink three to four drinks at least to feel a buzz. Um, my husband started becoming a bourbon collector and a lot of our social life really revolved around bourbon. And uh, we got married in 2016 and our reception was at the bourbon bar. Um, and right before we got married, my friends, uh, my really good friends uh, threw me a bachelorette party and all my gifts were alcohol related. 
And that is the first time I remember being really sad. Wow, mm. this is what my friends know of me, mm-hmm. you know? And it didn't make me change, um, but uh, I, you know, um, it continued. I was living in, like I say, Oakland, Northern California became super, super expensive. I had to work at least two full-time jobs to keep our lifestyle. And I started again drinking for stress relief. So I, I'm a professor. And so there is always grading to be done. And so I can grade at baseball games. I can grade at the bar. I could grade and, you know, I can always be grading. And like, I just started resenting that. And so I would just drink like I did with my dissertation to get through the grading. And I was um, going to, uh, again, you know, um, I would finish grading. My husband and I would watch TV. I would drink while watching TV. He would go to bed and I would continue drinking. And um, the first time that I really started questioning all the amount I was drinking was in 2017 we took an anniversary trip to Hawaii. It was our first year anniversary. And when we came back, I had an ear infection and being sick never stopped me from drinking like it did other people. Um, And I was drinking even though I wasn't feeling well. My husband had gone to bed, I was watching TV. I went to get up and I fell. Next thing I know, um, I've hit my face on the floor with my glasses and it's pouring blood. I wake up, uh, yeah, I wake up my husband and I'm like, he looks at it and he's like, you need to go to the hospital. We called the paramedics. They're like, yes, you need stitches. Um, We, my husband drew me to the hospital. I got, I've never been in the hospital before, ever for anything. Um, And so I got stitches uh, there. And that's when I started trying to decrease my drinking. That's when I started setting the rules and taking data. I'm very science driven. And so I was like, okay, uh, you know, 21 drinks a week, um, you know, no Mm -hmm. more than three drinks at a time, all that, all that stuff that that we do, um, but really failing to control it. And then in December of that year, um, I had noticed a lump earlier in the year in my armpit. And the doctor had said, you know, I don't think it's anything to worry about. We'll keep watching it. And um, that December, it just, it, it didn't look right. And so I went to the doctor and he's like, yeah, uh, that doesn't look good. Let's do an ultrasound. And um, sure enough, we did an ultrasound and during, during the ultrasound, they're like, oh, we need to do a biopsy. There's some things we don't like about this. And I knew, I knew right then and there. I was like, this is cancer, mm. this is cancer. And uh, sure enough, it, I got diagnosed in March of 2018. Um, and because we caught it so early, I just had a biopsy and then radiation treatment for six months, six weeks um, in June of 2018. I drank through the entire treatment. Um, I, I just wasn't like, I, I just thought, well, the radiation will kill everything. And, you know, it's now <laughs> I think, what was I thinking? But anyway, um, And again, being science minded, I had complete faith uh, faith in my treatment. You know, I knew science was going to work. I knew this radiation was going to work. Um, But I started researching ways to prevent reoccurrence. And one of the things that I found is that quitting alcohol was one of the main things I could control. Um, You know, there's many factors you can't control, but that drinking alcohol was one of them. And I was so surprised that none of my oncologists had told me this. I had gone to nutrition workshops um, for breast cancer survivors and um, people would ask, can we still drink? And the nutritionist would say, yeah, one or two drinks is fine. And I just, I couldn't believe that. (laughs) Um, And for uh, the first time at the end of 2018, I started trying to go one or two days without drinking. Um, And uh, I, you know, was going through some Reddit stuff. Um, and, you know, we all hate these uh, Facebook ads, but I love them because it, it led me to you. I saw, you know, I was uh, this naked mind um, live alcohol experiment in January of 2019. Wow. And uh, I joined that. Um, and it's the first time in my adult life I had gone 30 days without drinking. It was, I just thought it was going to be so hard. Um, it 
you know, it was hard, but it wasn't as hard as I thought. And uh, it just, I felt so good and I knew I was doing the right thing. Um, I ended up joining what was called the intensive in February because I felt like I needed a little bit more. I did start drinking again, uh, February, March. I quit for the last part in April. And then I just was in love with the program and what it had done. And I decided to become my coach in June of uh, 2019. And uh, uh, I faltered a little bit um, in July because uh, my mom was diagnosed with the same breast cancer that I had been diagnosed with, even though um, they did genetic markers and I didn't have them and she didn't either. Um, and I was like, well, if it wasn't, you know, I, I think I had sort of blamed like my lifestyle. And I was like, well, if it wasn't that, then, you know, maybe I should go back to drinking. And I talked to a couple coaches and were like, you know, what happened to your mom has nothing to do with you. And, um, you know, I came back to realize that, you know, I was doing this for me to be the healthiest version of myself. And that it didn't matter, you know, if hers wasn't alcohol related and we'll never know, you know, really what it, what it was, but I was doing something that was really good. Um, so I think in um, September, um, I had had, you know, I had gone pretty much alcohol free, but like I could go 30 days and then I'd have like a glass of wine with, you know, for my anniversary or a glass of, uh, you know, wine in on Labor Day. And I was like, why am I? doing this. So I said, you know, I'm going to go 100 days. If you're going to be a coach, you need to do this. And um, you're going to go 100 days. And I've never looked back. Um, you know, I started with, and maybe a lot of people are like this, they want to start because they want to be able to moderate. Um, but after the 100 days, I was like, why? Why would I want to do this? I feel so good. And this is so important to me. Um, and uh, you know, um, now I've uh, been coaching in the live alcohol experiments and I've been coaching in the path. And I just, my life has really basically done a 180. Oh, that's so cool. Thanks for sharing all of that. Wow. It's a lot, a lot of ups and downs and twists and turns. And so, how is your marriage now? How is oh, that? Wonderful. Yeah. Yes, it's so good. Um, I actually uh, was worried about it. You know, my husband still drinks and I was really worried about it. Um, he has a very large bourbon collection and luckily that's not what I choose, chose to drink. So it, it, it doesn't bother me. Um, he was very supportive, a little bit enabling at first, you know, like if it was hard and I'd be like, I just want to, do, he'd be like, well then have one. <laughs> Finally, I told him, I said, no, you need to help me. Um, but he's been very supportive and, um, about um, last year, sometime into it, I asked him, I said, you know, do you miss me drinking at all? Because, you know, we were drinking buddies. Mm -hmm. And right away, he said, no, not at all. Um, I'd become a mean drunk. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, be you know, I was being mean to him. And I wasn't um, relishing our relationship or working on it. Um, you know, I was just being angry all the time. Um, and so you know, he, um, he says I'm much happier and I, you know, our relationship is much better. So that's been really awesome to see and experience. That is so great. It's so good to hear. And then how has it gone sort of socially? Well, um, you know, in, in March of last year, COVID happened. Um, so a lot of our social events have been curtailed, but my husband is still very involved in the bourbon world. Um, so that I've gone to a couple events and he's very happy for me to go because I'm always the designated driver and I've learned, you know, I'll go and I always drive and I always say, um, you know, when I'm done, I'm gonna be done and I'm just gonna leave. And so I really learned to put those limits on myself as to, you know, when I can, when I've had enough about something. Um, so that's really been helpful. Um, like I said, I really love baseball games. Oops, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, I really love baseball games and um, I would always drink through baseball games. So I always was really worried about that. I thoroughly, 
um, but I've come to realize that, you know, I don't know why I was drinking for things I enjoy doing anyway, you know, mm -hmm. so like baseball games, concerts, um, all of this stuff that I, I would drink now, I get so much enjoyment out of just going and being in the moment, you know, watching the game, um, listening to the music. So those are the two things I really miss from this pandemic is being able to go and enjoy those things for sure. Um, but, yeah. you know, um, I, most people don't really, uh, you know, question me, um, question my drinking. And uh, I've learned, you know, my husband will have like Zoom um, stuff and I can hear him pe telling people that I quit, you know, so I can tell he's super proud of me. Um, and of course, I'm super proud of myself as well. That's so awesome. I love that so much. So um, let's talk a little bit about your coaching. Where can people find you? Well, um, one of the things that I've wanted to do is uh, I don't see too many coaches out there with helping people of color. And, you know, I think that there are a lot of us out there who have assimilated this American culture of drinking. And, you know, in Europe, uh, it's also a big problem, um, as I've seen. So I really um, have tailored my website. It's called Sazon Sin Alcohol. And a Sazon is a Goya product that you add to flavor food. So it's adding a spice of life, uh, adding spice to life without alcohol. That's what, what it means. So it, I'm at SazonSinAlcohol.com. Um, and that's where I have a Facebook group as well, um, if people would like to uh, find me there and find out some more information. I love that so much. And we'll put that in the links of the show for sure. So, oh, how wonderful. So Marilyn, let me ask you the question that I sort of end these with, which is if you could go back in time to talk to Marilyn, who, you know, was buying the cigarettes and the two buck Chuck and feeling like <laughs> life was falling apart about how things have all turned out, what would you tell her? Um, it's never too late. It's okay to be a late bloomer. Um, I'm, I just turned 50 and I'm living my best life at 50. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that when you stop drinking, um, while it seems impossible, when you do it, you'll realize that all these other goals of yours are not impossible either. You're going to gain confidence. You're going to remember so many things. Uh, your life is just really going to be better. And I like to say, you don't have to have a superpower to stop drinking, but when you stop drinking, you feel like you have a superpower. Mm, so true. So true. Yeah. I love that. I was actually on the phone with my cousin recently, and she was just talking to me about some stuff going on in her life and her marriage and stuff like that. But she said, and I thought it was so cool. She said, but you know what, Annie, I have always felt like the best time of my life is going to be late in life. And I was like, what a cool perspective. Like everybody is always thinking myself included like, Oh no, you know, getting older, kids are growing up. Like we get panicked about time passing and she doesn't because she just is, she's like, ever since I was little, I just have always had a view that my life is going to be the best very late in life. And I'm just looking forward to that. And not in a way that she's not, you know, living or enjoying her present life because she's a very grateful, happy human, but, but very, I was like, that is cool. Like true or not true. Like, I just like that perspective of having hope and, and never feeling like, oh, well, you know, just too old for that, or <laughs> just can't change. Or, you know, I had a woman on the podcast who was, I believe she was 86 and she oh, wow. changed her drinking. And wow. she was like so excited about it. And it was amazing. And I was like, there you go. Yep. Any time of life, right? So There's so cool. a quote that says that I really like that says, you know, what if the best moments in your life haven't, haven't, haven't happened yet? Mm. And I love that. I love, you know, um, that feeling that there is so much more to come um, that I don't know about. That's so exciting. Yeah. So I really want to thank you um, for all the work that you've done and for all the people that you've helped. And I just, I really, I really didn't think it was possible. And here I am, you know, I, I did it and I'm a coach and I, and, you know, and I'm loving this and it's, it's worth, um, it's worth doing. 
Um, oh, I love that so much. You're so welcome. And that's just amazing. Well, is there anything else you want to talk about or add? Um, no, I think um, that that's it. Um, uh, the only thing that I, I do have to say is, you know, there are a couple things that haven't happened to me. Um, like I didn't lose weight. I didn't get better sleep. Um, I think those are due to my cancer medications that I had to be on, but I'm okay with that. You know, it's so much mm -hmm. better being tired than tired and hungover. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm learning to be okay with um, food and, you know, I'm working on all of this stuff. And so, um, I've decided it's okay not to be a morning person because uh, I'm still not <laughs> a morning person, but I, I've just uh, accepted a lot of things about myself without beating myself up. So this whole process of not shaming yourself about the drinking has really extended to a lot of other parts of my life that now I'm, I'm looking at. So uh, like you say, it's alcohol is the first domino for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's so true. I feel like once that gets out of the way, it opens up your sort of ability to start doing all this other stuff. And you didn't even realize that alcohol was the one thing that was in the way. And so yep. it's just so cool. Yeah, I think that's so true. That's yeah. amazing. Well, this and is so been it, great. It, Thank you. Yeah, of course. No problem. And what were you going to say? Oh, I was going to say, so, you know, if anybody is listening to this and their significant other or their family members still drink, know that it really is possible. Um, yeah. And of course, the, you know, he's very supportive, but um, it, it really can be done. And I don't feel like I'm missing out at all. That's so cool. I love that so much. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. I loved hearing your story and thank I'm so excited to see where you go next. Thank you, Annie. I really appreciate it. And it, it was really fun. Are you ready for a deep dive and truly lasting change? If so, you might consider my intensive program. It's a nine week self-led program that you can do in the complete comfort of your own home and it will truly transform your relationship with alcohol. If you wanna learn more about this, go to thisnakedmind.com forward slash intensive. And as always, rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast as it truly helps the message reach somebody who might need to hear it today.